Hi, everyone. My name is Tom Sukonik. I'm the chair of the Forum Committee, and I'd like to welcome you to our Renaissance Society Spring Speakers Forum. Today, it's a real honor and a treat to kick off our Spring Forum with Dr. Rick Rosberg, a distinguished professor of ecology and evolution and a marine biologist at UC Davis. Rick is also director of the UC Davis Coastal Marine Sciences Institute. He re received his PhD from Yale University and is the former president of both the Western Society of Naturalists and the American Society of Naturalists. He's also currently serving as a science advisor to several state and federal agencies, including the Smithsonian Institution. Dr. Grossberg will share little known facts about Charles Darwin's notoriously complicated and misunderstood relationship with the sea, including the fact that after being unimaginably seasick for five long years on the Beagle, Darwin never got on a ship again, not even a rowboat. So without further ado, here's Professor Rick Grossberg. Hello, everybody. Let me just share my screen and away we go. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Tom, for that kind introduction. Um, I'm very, very honored to be here. I'm happy to have all of you here joining me on this beautiful afternoon in Sacramento. Um, I'm a native Californian. And when I see a day like today with the camellias blooming outside my window and it's sunny and 70, I don't know whether to gloat about it or whether to panic about it because I feel like it's a drought, but what a great day to go out and have a bike ride or a walk in the park and just be out. So I'll not go on for too long. So today I wanna to talk about one of the um, inspirations for my entire career. When I was an undergraduate at UC Santa Cruz many, many years ago, I was, as many people of my generation were then, kind of clueless about exactly what I wanted to do. And then I took a breadth class um, in which we read on the origin of species by means of natural selection. And as the group of freshman students and our professor leader worked our way through that book, I realized exactly what I wanted to do for the rest of my life, which is to study evolution. That's pretty much what I've done. And it wasn't until much later in my life, like in the last decade or so, that I became really interested in both Darwin as a marine scientist, but also Darwin's life and how his life shaped him becoming a scientist. It's not often that we have a chance, um, and Friday afternoon seems like a good time to do it, to sort of try and understand where someone like Darwin came from. What was it about him that made him so special? And how did his career unfold? Was it just luck? Did he just happen to take a class that changed his life? Or was he sort of born to be this way? Um, so that's what I want to explore with you all today by kind of going through the early parts of his life. And because I'm a marine biologist, um, not that I have a lot more in common with Darwin, um, I wanted to sort of start with that as the starting point. So I also want to just remind everybody that there will be a fair number of slides. There's a lot of information. Um, I think Tom mentioned that there will be facts in this, um, but I just want to say um, facts take a weird place seemingly in our society and culture these days. Um, and don't worry too much about them because it won't be on the exam. So Charles Darwin sort of is famous for the idea of evolution by natural selection. And the fundamental sort of logic underlying the theory of evolution by natural selection is encapsulated in what Darwin said. And that is, if you accept that natural traits vary, um, that the variation is passed on from parent to offspring, it's heritable. And that there is, as he called it, a struggle for existence, although that simply meant that there was indirect or direct competition among individuals for resources then evolution by natural selection has to follow. That is, if individuals vary in traits, if some of those traits affect how they reproduce or how much they reproduce or how well they survive, and those traits that influence survival or reproduction or both are passed from parent to offspring, then those traits in a particular environment that are favored by that environment will increase in frequency in the population because those individuals that inherit those traits will survive or reproduce better than those that didn't. And that's essentially the gist of it. And 
The great historian and philosopher of evolutionary biology shown on the far right, Daniel Dennett said, infamously or famously, if I were to give an award for the single best idea anyone has ever had, I'd give it to Darwin ahead of Newton, Einstein, and everybody else. And here's what Dennett argued basically. In a single stroke, the idea of evolution by natural selection unifies the realm of life, meaning, and purpose with the realm of space and time, cause and effect, mechanism and physical law. And that's what he wrote in 1995. And I still like to think that that really captures the huge implications of the simple quote that I just read you from Darwin about the gist of natural selection. It fundamentally changed the way human beings think about themselves, where they came from, their place on the earth and in the universe, and their place in the whole grand scheme of the tree of life. Darwin was born on the 12th of February, 18, 1809, the same day that Abraham Lincoln was born, the same day and the same year. He died on the 19th of April in 1882 at the age of 73. And I show you these three pictures just to remind you that he actually was a young boy, not the old man that's often shown in the picture under 1880 on the right of your screen. But in 1860, when he was a mere 44 years old, you get a sense of how quickly humans aged in that time. Um, Darwin led quite a comfortable life, and yet life was hard on people. They got sick a lot. Um, they didn't have vaccinations, um, and they contracted pretty much every disease that one could imagine. In fact, when Darwin was born, um, the bacterial um, basis or the viral basis of pathogenic disease was almost completely unknown and misunderstood. So first, I want to start a little bit with his early life. Darwin was the offspring, one of three offspring, of one Susanna Wedgwood and one Dr. Robert Waring Darwin. Susanna Wedgwood was one of the heir heiresses or heirs to the Wedgwood family fortune in ceramics. Um, and Dr. Robert Waring Darwin was a physician, nominally a family physician, such, a, such as it was at the time. And uh, Darwin had two siblings, um, uh, an older sister, Carolyn Darwin, to whom he was very close, his older brother, Erasmus, or Eris Darwin, and then there's Charles. And they were a very, very tight-knit family um, that um, got together as often as possible and relied on each other quite often. In fact, their mother died when they were quite young, and their father, Robert Waring Darwin, was quite distant from the rest of the children in the family. He was born in a small town in Shropshire called Shrewsbury, and I have a little circle around where his house was on the river that went around Shrewsbury, and I've blown up the picture of the house that the Darwin family grew up in which was um, sort of pompously called the mountain Mount. Um, people named their houses in these days. And I guess that house is kind of substantial and fancy enough to warn its own name. Um, they lived an incredibly comfortable life. They were not extraordinarily wealthy, um, but through all their lives, they were comfortably well off and they wanted for very little. And this is just a memorial to Darwin now um, in, Shro in Shrewsbury. Um, so you can sort of get a sense of um, they, they know who he was, and they're proud to have him as um, one of their citizens. Now, Darwin's life as a young boy is often um, really misunderstood. Um, he was often characterized in early biographies as a very obedient, kind of subservient, reclusive, um, bookwormish child. But we now know that that really is simply not true, that he was um, a risk taker an experimenter. Um, he really liked messing around. And the picture on the right is just sort of a fanciful de depiction. But we know that he and his brother Eris um, messed around with really bad stuff a lot of time at home. And we know that because we actually have the fire logs from the Shrewsbury um, Fire Department, basically the fire brigade. And they made often two or three trips a month to the mount to put out fires that were started by the Darwin boys. And a more recent biography does a better um, way of capturing, a more accurate way of capturing sort of who Darwin was as a young boy. Many ways a naughty boy, passionate and quarrelsome with a tendency to tell fibs and a liking for reading, solitary walks, 
bird watching, collecting all sorts of things, climbing trees, fast running and fishing. And I'm going through this just sort of to reconcile the old man vision that many of us have of Darwin with what he was probably really like as a young boy, which is, um, uh, you know, interesting, difficult, ar argumentative, and basically not a compromiser. So I'm going to tell this story about Darwin's relationship to the sea and how it sort of set the foundation, probably to some extent a calculated, but sometimes a fortuitous foundation for his development about his, the development of his ideas about natural selection and evolution um, by natural selection. And I'm going to tell it in three chapters. The first chapter are the events leading up to his time as a medical student at the University of Edinburgh. And that'll have two sort of subheadings from medicine to marine biology. And then his development or his exposure to ideas about evolution and embryology, in this case, the development of animals from early fertilized eggs or embryos into, a young, into adults and what that could tell us about the evolutionary process. The second chapter will be about a book that he wrote and he began to write when he was on the voyage of the Beagle called The Structure and Distribution of Coral Reefs and specifically what the mechanisms were that coral, by which coral atolls formed. And um, this sort of geological story, sort of it's a biological and geological story, um, is often sort of skipped over. Um, it sort of treated as a book that he wrote and it got him admission into the Royal Society of England, um, but not really important. And I think that that has been deeply and profoundly misread and I'll try and explain why. And then the final chapter has to do with um, an infatuation, almost a decade long infatuation with barnacles. And I too am infatuated with barnacles for a whole variety of reasons. And so I'll spend a little time sort of talking about some of the lessons that, that Darwin learned from studying barnacles and pretty much nothing but barnacles locked away at his house, downhouse for almost a decade. Okay, so the Edinburgh years. So as many of you know, the University of Edinburgh, actually pretty much throughout Europe and the United Kingdom at the time, um, the University of Edinburgh was considered pretty much the finest university or among the finest universities in, in Europe and England, certainly um, in a caliber above um, Cambridge and Oxford. Um, Edinburgh was also an intellectual and arts center of Western Europe and England. Um, it was quite an animated and it still is quite a remarkable place to visit for those of you who have been there. Um, there's a picture of Darwin's older brother, Erasmus Darwin in the lower left and a picture or an artist rendition of Darwin when he um, was probably about a year or two, I, my guess is this is in rendition in 1826. So Darwin was 17 or 18 in that picture. And then the picture on the lower right is a picture of what the pharmaceutical lab looked like at the University of Edinburgh at the medical school. Darwin was sent up to Edinburgh um, as sort of to accompany his brother and to train as a physician himself. And Darwin was clearly not suited from the very, very beginning to become a surgeon. Um, for one thing, as I'm sure you all know, Anesthesia um, was not invented actually until about 25 or 30 years later. Um, and I should mention it wasn't even widely, widely used until the late 1850s and early 1860s, even though it was available when Queen Victoria for the birth of her second child insisted that she be given chloroform, not just to um, dull the pain, so to speak, but to provide royal leadership to surgeons who refused to use anesthesia during surgeries because they felt that it wasn't quote unquote manly to do it. And so Darwin wrote, I attended on two occasions the operating theater in the university in the hospital at Edinburgh and saw two very bad operations, one on a child, but I rushed away before they were completed, nor did I ever attend again. The two cases fairly haunted me for many a long year. And of course, surgery without anesthesia, people were given a lot of whiskey to sedate them, but sed sedation doesn't actually prevent pain. It doesn't prevent shock. Um, and the rush to get a search major operation completed was to prevent the patient from going into shock and dying before you were done. Um, and the surgical kit that I have shown on the lower right, um, some of my undergraduates um, were convinced that that was a carpenter's woodworker's toolkit. That is actually a brain surgeon's toolkit. 
um, during the time that Darwin was a student at the University of Edinburgh. So Darwin basically started cutting class and leaving medical school within nine or 10 months of arriving there and tried to avoid surgical operations and going to classes and studying very hard. And he found himself um, sort of attaching himself to one quote unquote, Professor Robert Grant. I should say I have the professor in quotes because Grant is sort of a self-proclaimed professor. He wasn't actually a professor. He was kind of a member of the academic and research community in Edinburgh at the time um, and liked to be addressed Professor Grant, but he had no official appointment as a professor in any university. Nevertheless, he was quite an accomplished naturalist. And um, Darwin started going for walks by the seashore on the Firth of Forth with Grant. Um, and they would go through the tide pools, talk with each other, and Grant would pontificate, as professors do, and like I guess I'm doing right now, um, about what he thought was going on in those tide pools and the plants and animals that inhabited them. And Darwin wrote later, um, he, Professor Robert Grant, one day burst forth in high admiration of Lamarck and his views on evolution. I listened in silent astonishment. I had previously read the Zenomia of my grandfather in which similar views are maintained. And he continues, it's probable that hearing rather early in life, this is when Darwin was 17 or 18, such views maintained and praised may have favored my upholding them under a different form. So um, both his grandfather as Erasmus, who was a loquacious, crazed philosopher, an ardent abolitionist, wrote, a hundred pages about one topic when one page would have done. Um, he was um, an advocate for evolution and the idea of evolution, the idea that life had changed since it first became established on the planet, and that one form gave rise to another form. And then, of course, many of you know that Lamarck then refined some of those ideas, but the mechanism by which Lamarck um, proposed that evolutionary change occurred and produced design, what we call design or good fit or adaptation in nature, Lamarck imagined that the environment directly transformed plants and animals during their lives to be well adjusted to the particular environment. And then those characteristics were somehow transmitted to the heritable material nobody knew about genes. Nobody even knew that the stuff of inheritance was in sperm and eggs, but somehow the environment transformed plants and animals and their traits so that they better fit the environment. And then those traits, the inheritance of acquired characteristics were transmitted to offspring. Of course, Darwin recognized that that's actually not how adaptation occurred and how design and nature occurred. Instead, populations and individuals varied in their heritable traits and the environment sorted or selected among those that had advantageous traits in that environment and those that had less advantageous traits, which over time accumulated in what we would call adaptive change in the composition of the population. Now, Grant, no question about it, was a dive in the wool evolutionist. But as you'll see, he wasn't in Darwin's league as a scientist. So Grant, as I mentioned, read Erasmus Darwin's Zenomia and believed, as Darwin's grandfather claimed in that book, that life on Earth had arisen from one living filament. And Grant resolved, he really made it the goal of much of his scientific career to find out what that one living filament was. And like other what they call transmutationists, evolutionists of the time, Grant was confident that the organism that gave rise to the other forms had lived in the sea. And that's where Grant started first becoming really a marine biologist and drew Darwin into the sea as a budding young marine scientist. Now, Grant, was absorbed by the possibility, as Keith Thompson wrote in 2009 in a really nice biography of Charles Darwin, the young Charles Darwin. Grant was absorbed, as Thompson put it, by the possibility that animal and plant kingdoms were in fact not separate and distinct from each other, but that certain primitive organisms still living at the time remaining to be discovered, things like sponges and what he called flustrae, which I'll show you a little bit about in just a second, retain the properties of that indistinguishable plant, animal, ancestral, chimeric organism. And so he set about studying organisms that he thought might retain the plant 
and animal characteristics of the earliest living forms on Earth. So I want to tell you about Darwin's first big discovery, which happened while he was sort of working as a colleague, collaborator, and apprentice to, quote unquote, Professor Grant. So if you look at the upper left panel, you'll see, um, and you can probably follow, oops, see. if you look at the upper left panel, you can see in the red circle, there are a bunch of little tiny black dots. Um, they look kind of like peppercorns. And in fact, they were called seed peppercorns. The upper right shows one of them blowing up. There's a little stalk that anchors a brown black globular body, in this case, to the body of a lobster. And the question that Grant struggled with, but really didn't know the answer to, because I don't think he knew what to look at, was whether or not those little black spherical peppercorns were plant-like, like this Fucus laureus here, or they were animal-like, like this skate leech shown attached to, in fact, the ray of a skate. And he was talking about that with Darwin and Darwin made it his own little project to figure this out. And really Grant was stumped. And what Darwin wrote in his notebook, which he shared with Grant is quote, I showed that the little globular bodies then sometimes called sea peppercorns, which had been supposed to be the young state of the seaweed, Fucus laureus, were actually the egg carrying cases of the worm like Pontobdella muricata. That is, these things carried baby leeches, not plant spores. They were animals, no question about it. This is a question that was a big question at the time. There was a big argument at the time. And Grant had hoped that they were neither plant nor animal. And Darwin simply did something in retrospect that was so obvious. He watched for months those little black globular bodies and waited to see what happened. And what emerged from them was tiny baby leeches. It seems so obvious, but it actually hadn't occurred to Grant to do that. Okay, now everyone says that Darwin left medical school because he found it so brutal, um, especially surgery. And by all accounts, Darwin was throughout his life one of the most empathetic people ever. I mean, he was deeply affected by other people's pain and deeply empathetic to their pain. In any case, a few days after Darwin showed his discovery to Grant, Grant published a notice in, the, um, in, in the, one of the um, Scottish scientific journals in which he said, the ova of the Pontobdella muricata or skate, skate leech, this is the skate leech down here, consists of small colored spheres attached by a narrow twisted neck to a spreading membranous base. And then I've emphasized the merit of having first ascertained them to belong to that animal is due to my zealous young friend, Mr. Charles Darwin of Shrewsbury, who kindly presented me with specimens of the ova exhibiting the animal in different stages of maturity. And um, what Darwin basically, um, he was cheated here. He was sort of like, you know, this kid kind of showed these things to me but I'm taking the credit for it. Darwin should have been the author on this paper. He made the discovery and he told, in fact, Grant what these things were. Grant didn't figure it out himself. So that happened. And then a few months later, this is what happened. Darwin was, instead of working on those little black sea peppercorns, he was working on these organisms here called Flustra foliacea. And we now know that Flustra belongs to a group of animals called bryozoans, plant or moss animals, but in fact, they're perfectly good animals. But the way that they grow made people like Grant and his contemporaries believe that they maybe were kind of chimeric organisms or early plant animal ancestors, which subsequently transformed by processes then poorly understood into a group of organisms we know as plants and a group of organisms we know as animals. And here's what Darwin wrote in his book, in 18, notebook in 1827. From not having had any regular practice in dissection and from possessing only a wretched microscope, my attempts were very poor. Nevertheless, I made one very interesting little discovery that the so-called ova of flustra had the power of independent movement by means of cilia and were in fact larvae. And here they are shown right here in the lower, 
Sorry about that. Shown in the lower right, they have their little tiny balls, swimming balls powered by cilia. They're perfectly good animals. Now, um, Darwin processed this, and we didn't actually know about this until the um, note notebooks um, in Henrietta Litchfield, which was Darwin's cousin, um, were published. And she wrote, he, Darwin, rushed to Professor Grant, who was working on the same subject to tell him, thinking he would be delighted with so curious a fact. That is, they were ciliated little things inside that plant animal, that that plant animal was an animal. And Grant responded, he was confounded on being told, Darwin was confounded on being told that it was very unfair of him, that is Darwin, to work at Professor Grant's subject. And in fact, that he should take ill, that is Grant should take ill if Darwin published it. And then literally a week later, Grant published it. And he wrote, by examining the ovum within its capsule with the microscope, we perceive with the royal we, not Darwin and he, perceive its cilia, that makes it an animal, in rapid motion. And he wrote, I have frequently observed the ovum, the egg in this situation, contract itself in different directions, shrink back in its capsule, and exhibit other signs of irritability before its final escape. And within a week of that being published, Darwin quit Edinburgh and went back home. And I think for those of us who are in the audience who are scientists or intellectuals or have had this kind of experience, um, I think it's pretty easy to look back on this and see that maybe Darwin's disgust with surgery and being a physician played a role in his leaving Edinburgh, but almost certainly um, his so-called mentor, Robert Grant, screwed him intellectually twice. And if ever I had a piece of advice to give to any of my students, if ever a mentor did that to them, it's time to find another mentor and try something different. So I think Darwin actually left Edinburgh um, because of his sort of conflict and bad mentoring by Grant, and not just because he was disgusted by surgery. But Grant did give some gifts to Darwin. This was really important. And the idea of embryology, the development of an organism, providing a clue to its ancestry, I think was really, really critical. Grant wrote, the description of the ova of lower animals, that is early animals, forms an interesting though much neglected part of, and this is my emphasis, the history of the species. And I think this is also a gift of Darwin to Grant by showing how these different kinds of unknown things developed, it provided a clue to what they were, plant or animal. So the history, the evolutionary history of a species or an organism is often not fully, but partly reflected in the way its own life cycle develops, its embryology or ontogeny. Okay, end almost of chapter one. So um, Darwin comes home, his father writes to his son, Charles, 17 year old son, Charles, you care for nothing but shooting dogs and rat catching and you'll be disgraced to yourself and all your family. I try and think of things like that I've said to my kids that have been painfully wrong. But in fact, um, uh, he, Darwin's father was very, very wrong about him being disgraced to himself and his family. But he did come back home and he did kind of mess around shooting rats, hunting, and basically messing around while he tried to figure out what to do. His father grew impatient with him and said, fine, you're gonna to study to become a minister and sent him off to the University of Cambridge where um, you could study to be a minister and you could basically buy your failed kid a ticket to going to college. So Darwin's um, rooms at Christ College are shown there in the upper left. There's a picture of the Christ College Common there in the center. And Darwin, although he was really pretty much a sort of C plus C student most of the time, and he's, he himself often wrote, I spent way too much time in the pubs and far too little time studying, um, was by all accounts, a very, very average student. But one of his teachers in particular, John Henslow, a famous botanist, recognized extraordinary talent in Darwin and nurtured his career. They often took walks in the woods, didn't save his academic record by any stretch of the imagination, but clearly understood that Darwin 
was an extraordinarily gifted biologist. When Darwin finished up at Cambridge in 1831, there really wasn't a lot for him to do. And he decided that he wanted to sort of set out exploring and kind of messing around, you know, the usual after college trip to Europe or wherever. Um, and um, his dad wanted nothing of it. And then Henslow mentioned that there might be a place for Darwin on an expedition um, to survey the coast of South America. And through a very complicated, this is a whole additional talk, set of negotiations and discussions, um, Captain Robert Fitzroy, shown there in the upper left, um, who was the captain of the Beagle and was assigned to chart um, ports in the coastline of South America and essentially do around the world voyage shown by the red trace in the map um, produced around the same time that the voyage of the Beagle took place, took Darwin on not as a ship's naturalist, not as a physician, but he took Darwin on as a companion. As they set out across the Atlantic Ocean in 1831, Darwin um, uh, you know, was a good buddy to Fitzroy. Um, they commiserated and talked, I should say at the time, that captains of vessels like this did not commiserate with the crews. They didn't take meals with the crew. They rarely went below decks. They stuck pretty much to their quarters um, and, and, um, and didn't mix with the rest of the crew members. But the ship's naturalist and physician basically had a mental breakdown crossing the Atlantic on the way to South America. And, Dar and left in South America and sailed back to the UK, to England. Um, and Darwin remained on and functionally took on the role of the ship's naturalist, charting um, waters, um, sampling from the water in the ocean, and also, um, as you'll see, um, going on land a great deal to sample the flora and the fauna throughout South America, the Galapagos, the Indo-Pacific, and eventually all the way back to England around the world. The voyage was supposed to take a year or two. It took five. It took five years on a 93 foot vessel. And for those of you who uh, can imagine what a 93 foot vessel is, um, just remember it seems kind of big, but it's actually not that big in the middle of the Atlantic. There were 73 men, no women, plenty of animals, uh, some domestic, some not, and there were no showers. They sailed across the Atlantic Ocean and across the Pacific, essentially without having a real shower for most of the time. That's what the Beagle looked like. That's what below decks in the middle of that slide looked like. Um, the, they had all kinds of crazy stuff going on in that ship. Um, it was probably seriously disgusting. And on top of that, here's one other thing that Darwin and I have in common. And that is we both get notoriously seasick. My mother always wanted to be, me to be a real marine biologist like an oceanographer. And the first time I went out to sea, I knew I would never do it again. Darwin, after crossing the Atlantic, knew that he never, ever wanted to get a ship on a ship again, but there was no other way to get home. And so he stayed on that ship for almost five years, desperately seasick the whole time. But every chance he got to go overland, he did. And so basically, Darwin would get dropped off on a port, take a group of, of supporters with him, and travel overland, sampling the local flora and fauna, investigating all kinds of geological phenomena. Um, and then meet the ship at the next port and then sail together to the next port. This is sort of to give you a perspective for those of you who have never been at sea in a small sailing ship in a big ocean. And as they sailed around, of course, the southern coast of South America, that is probably the, that part of the Southern Ocean is the most treacherous wild ocean in the world. Um, it was a rough passage and Darwin had a rough time. And um, as some of you may know, once Darwin got back to the UK, back to England, he never ever got on a boat again for any reason. He would not even get on a rowboat in the local canal to go paddling with his children. And I feel kind of the same way. He went back to London to work on the collections that he'd made while he was on the Voyage of the Beagle um, and at the Natural History Museum. And he contemplated a lot of things besides whether or not what all his specimens were, helped him get them identified and so on and so forth. He also contemplated the pros and cons of getting married um, because his family was putting him under considerable pressure. And I'm not gonna spend a lot of time reading this. 
Um, I'll make sure that the slides are available for you guys if, if you want them. And of course, if you're watching on YouTube, you can watch this again. But Darwin um, really had a habit of making lists about pros and cons of pretty much everything that he did. Um, and so, you know, there were the assets of marrying. You get children, you get a constant companion, um, you get a home, you get the charms of music and female chit chat, um, but it's a terrible loss of time. And he thought it was intolerable, as he put it, to spend one's whole life like a neuter bee working, working, and nothing at all, no one do. Imagine living all one's, all one's days solitarily in smoky and dirty London house. Only, only picture to yourself a nice soft wife on a sofa with a good fire, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And then marry, marry, marry QED, but not marry. Freedom to go where one liked, choice of society and little of it. He was not a very social animal. Conversation of clever men at clubs, not forced to visit relatives. You'll lose a lot of time. You can't read in the evenings. You get fat and idle. So he weighed the pros and cons, but he decided to get married. And you'll see the question is, who? Now, this is Darwin's family tree. And you can see um, on the upper right here, here is Erasmus Darwin, his great grandfather, and Mary Howard gave birth to three children, Robert Waring Darwin, Robert Waring Darwin, another Erasmus Darwin, and Charles, another Charles Darwin. And Robert Waring Darwin, in turn, um, married Susanna Wedgwood. And Susanna Wedgwood was the daughter of Sarah Wood, Wedgwood and Josiah Wedgwood. And Josiah, Sarah Sr. and Josiah Sr. gave birth to Josiah Jr. and Susanna. And Susanna Wedgwood married Robert Waring, Darwin's father, and gave birth to Charles Robert Darwin, as well as Carolyn, Carolyn Darwin. Um, and then in turn, Charles Darwin, our Charles Darwin, married the daughter of Josiah Wedgwood and Bessie Allen, Emma Wedgwood. So Darwin himself was the product of a first cousin marriage and Darwin himself married his first cousin. And then Darwin's sister, Carolyn, married her first cousin, Josiah Wedgwood. So there were a lot of first cousin marriages. Was it about blood? Was it about money or both? And Darwin remained deeply conflicted about this his whole life. On the one hand, you know, you all know that marrying your first cousin can be a very bad idea because inbreeding exposes what we now call deleterious recessive alleles, which normally just travel through populations as pretty much harmless mutations because it takes two copies of them in one individual to produce a bad effect. Um, most of the time, unless you're marrying your relatives, the odds that they carry a similar copy to you is extremely low. But when you marry a cousin or a sibling, the odds get higher and higher that they'll carry the same deleterious copy that you will. On the other hand, lots of very famous people married their first cousin, Albert Einstein, Sergei Rachmaninoff, Thomas Malthus, the great demographer, Igor Stravinsky, H.G. Wells, Edgar Allan Poe, and of course, most of the Habsburgs, which did suffer a lot of the consequences of inbreeding. Darwin married his first cousin and they set about their life in Downhouse. Um, and he really transformed from being a marine biologist to an armchair biologist. This is what Downhouse looks like now. It's an extraordinarily beautiful house. Um, and he lived there from 1842 until his death in 1882. Um, he spent most of his time hanging out with his friends. He actually rarely left Downhouse. Um, he occasionally went to London, but pretty much nowhere else. His colleagues and collaborators were Joseph Hooker and Charles Lyell, among others. And he also became close colleagues and collaborators with one Thomas Henry Huxley, um, who was um, a great orator and a great advocate of, Dian of Darwin's. Um, he was often called Darwin's pit bull. Darwin actually hardly ever spoke for himself in public. He made a lot of babies at Downhouse. He made 10 babies. Two of them died quite young. Actually, three of them died quite young. Two died before age two. And then his daughter, his beloved Annie, died at age 11. Three of his kids, Francis, Horace, and George, all became fellows of the Royal Society and were extremely accomplished scientists themselves. However, many of his children had serious, serious health problems, some of which may have had something to do 
with him having married his first cousin. And in fact, Darwin fretted over that his entire life. When he wasn't making babies at Down House, he was doing experiments in his greenhouses, breeding plants. Um, and he also, on the lower left, you can see the famous sand walk, where he took two or three hours every day and walked by himself and thought, as it turns out, what were great thoughts. His life there was very terrestrial. Um, he rarely, rarely went out, um, except in the woods near his house. Um, and he did most of his work in his study. Um, he took his dinner with his family. They had um, one or two servants. Um, they were all paid servants. And you can see the dining room there was not a grand dining room. It was sort of a family dining room where they rarely entertained. And if they did, it was just with a few guests. But the ocean wasn't ever far from Darwin's mind. And you can see in his notebooks as early as 1837 that as he was developing his ideas, his tree of life ideas, on the lower left in the green circle, you can see that he first depicted his tree of life as what he called a coral of life with the base of the branches dead. And so the passages, the early evolutionary history can't be seen and just the tips of the branches. And that eventually gave rise to a more botanically botanical metaphor for an evolutionary tree shown in the famous diagram um, that I've blown up here, where he simply says, I think, and he starts to write out his ideas about evolution as a process that generates a branching tree. And then he gives up and he actually draws a tree with letters at the tips that are new species. And he shows the branching process. That is the fundamental way we still understand evolution to occur. And on the lower right or the far right, I sort of have a diagram. This to me is the litmus test of whether you really, really are an evolutionary biologist. That is, you get the Darwin's tree permanently mounted on your body. Now, the next chapter I want to turn to, and I can see I'm running out of time, so I'm going to make this pretty fast. I apologize for that, is a process that I would call retrodiction. And this, as it turned out, was critical for Darwin. And I think it's only recently become understood how important his study on how atolls form, um, what an important role that played in his development of the theory of evolution. The problem is that evolution is an historical process and much of it happened before one could do an experiment or observe the processes unfolding in real time. And so how could you sort of make a prediction about what happened in the past? How could you test a prediction about what happened in the past? And it became clear from a bunch of recent notebooks that were um, released that in fact, Darwin understood that studying atolls and how they form could provide him with a way to think about historical processes and test hypotheses about historical processes. Part of this was motivated by him reading Charles Lyell, the great geologist. And Lyell, fundamental theory um, about geology was what was called uniformitarianism. And the idea behind uniformitarianism, uniformitarianism is embodied in the famous aphorism, the present is the key to the past. Up until Lyell, most geologists thought that the major landforms on, planet, on the planet were generated by huge catastrophes, meteors striking giant kind of uh, noatic um, uh, uh, floods and, and, and huge great ice storms and, and, and great events um, and catastrophes as they were called. And what Lyell recognized is very small changes in the short term can add up to huge changes over geological time scales. And at the same time, geologists were beginning to recognize that the Earth wasn't 5,000 or 10,000 years old. It was hundreds of millions. And as it turns out, it's probably about four and a half billion years old. Now, Lyell wasn't an evolutionary biologist. He didn't imagine that the processes of gradual change that occurred in, in the geological record were applicable to the evolution of life on Earth. But Darwin started to think that way. And his thinking, although he didn't write much about it, uh, it can be sort of seen in the way he thought about the problem of retrodiction and how atolls form. So I'm going to go through that quickly. So retrodiction is the hypothesis that some event happened in the past as opposed to the prediction that an event will happen in the future. And a successful retrodiction could confirm a theory as much as a successful prediction into the future. So here's the famous book published in 1842. That's what a coral reef is. As many of you know, coral reefs 
are sort of symbiotic organisms that represent a partnership between a living animal, a coral animal, and a symbiotic plant-like organism called zooxanthellae. And together, they build these reefs, these amazing reefs, some of which take the forms of these atolls, these circular reef-like structures that surround a central lagoon. And Darwin's basic hypothesis was that coral reefs, coral atolls formed around volcanoes that subsided over time. And as the volcano subsided and eroded, <clears throat> the reef eventually built up around the volcanic cone. So this is sort of shown both in a series of photographs on the right set of panels and diagrams on the left panel. So initially we start with a volcano, and then you can see in the white, a fringing reef develops around the volcano, shown here. And then as the volcano subsides over time, a lagoon forms around the protruding volcano, forming what's called the barrier reef, shown in this panel. And then eventually, as the volcano continues to subside, the reef continues to accrete around the edges of what was once the volcano. And because, in fact, the living part of the reef is right near the surface, because the plants that are the partners with the coral part of the reef require sunlight, eventually, once the volcano is completely subsided, you get a coral atoll like this. <clears throat> And what Darwin predicted is that if he were right, then the coral part of the atoll would be enormously thick over time. That's shown in the right panel. That is corals grow upwards on a sinking volcanic island. Alexander Agassiz, on the other hand, the great American um, zoologist and geologist said, that's not how it works at all, Darwin. Corals grow atop an underwater mountain and they're just a small veneer of living tissue on top of that mountain. And Darwin predicted that if he were right, then when you could actually drill down into a mountain or a coral atoll, you would find not a thin veneer of coral, but an enormously thick layer of dead coral, dead coral, dead coral, with a thin veneer of living coral that had accumulated on top. He didn't live to test that hypothesis. But in fact, we now know what the answer is. And that is Darwin was right. When we set off a hydrogen bomb in Anahuitac Atoll in the Mar Marshall Islands, um, before that happened, the USGS actually drilled a hole on the atoll to understand its geology. And when they drilled that hole in 1953, Here's what the quote is. Drilling on Anahuitac Atoll, Marshall Islands, and my dad actually was stationed on Anahuitac during World War II, revealed the presence of olivine basalt. That's the volcanic material. Beneath shallow water and limestone, that's limestone that was formed in shallow water, but wasn't necessarily in shallow water, of Eocene age at a depth of 4,154 feet. So they had to drill through 4,154 feet of coral before they got to the volcano. Darwin retradicted that that's what we would find if his mechanism was right. And it turns out Darwin was right and Agassiz was wrong. And I believe that Darwin said about this exercise to pose a hypothesis that could be tested about something that happened in the past because he recognized that the theory of evolution by natural selection would only be tested or could only at that time be tested by retrodiction. Now we can make predictions and we know that evolution occurs at a fast enough rate so we can observe it in real time. And then I'm gonna really fly through the barnacle years um, and this won't take that long, I apologize. Darwin um, published that book in 1842, was exhausted, but then set about studying barnacles and spent the next nine years working on barnacles. And by any measure, barnacles are weird animals. Um, I'm going to play like two seconds of this video. They are the only sessile attached crustaceans. All other crustaceans are mobile organisms that are capable of swimming around and finding their mates. But barnacles secondarily became attached. And this posed a huge problem for them because how do they copulate and find their mates? Well, you know, most crustaceans can swim around and find their mates and 
class them and, and copulate. But see those long white structures? Well, that's a barnacle penis. And barnacles have far and away the longest penises, according to their body size, of any organism on the planet. So these barnacles are about, oh, half an inch across, and their penises are about six inches long. I don't need any of us in this room to sort of speculate and uh, what that might look for a bigger organism. Barnacle life cycles are such that the um, fertilized egg develops into a little swimming larva shown on the lower left, which develops into a later stage larva, and that eventually attaches to a rock and spends the rest of its life attached to the rock. Now, um, why did Darwin spend almost a decade on barnacles? Well, you could argue that he really wanted to know a lot about barnacles. Um, and in fact, some barnacle biologists, also known as cirripidologists, um, argued that his monograph on the uh, Syrupedes, the barnacles, was his greatest work. Um, and um, it probably wasn't his greatest work, probably on the origin of species and many other books were greater. But it sure did play an important role in his development of evolutionary theory. And he, he, he Darwin himself, became tired of barnacles. Um, but he recognized, as he said in his letter to his dear colleague, Joseph Hooker, how painfully true is your remark that no one has hardly the right to examine the question of species. That is, what's a species and how did they evolve? was not minutely described lots of them. And that's what he was doing. But he was doing a lot more than that. One of the things that he wanted to know is why all barnacles were hermaphroditic or almost all were hermaphroditic, unlike almost all other crustaceans, which had separate sexes. And he knew that the ancestors to all barnacles copulated, but he also knew that barnacles were only the only secondarily sessile crustaceans. So he hypothesized that the most recent common ancestor of all barnacles was hermaphroditic. And that is a reproductive assurance kind of idea. That is, if you're both male and female, then you can gain a partner when it's hard to find a partner because you can't swim to find one by being both a male and a female at the same time. Now, the other thing that Darwin recognized in his studies that some barnacles actually had separate sexes. And oftentimes when they have separate sexes, the male is not a regular barnacle. Instead, it's called a dwarf or parasitic male. And the penis of, and that's shown there in the upper left panel under B. This is the penis of that male. He has no gut, no way of making a living on his own. He's tiny compared to the female. And he too has a giant penis. These males, as he said, consist of a mere bag lined by a few muscles. It has an orifice at its upper end and within it, within it there lies coiled up like a giant great worm, the proboscis to penis. Um, I've had um, female colleagues of mine say, well, nothing's changed in males for a long time. And this is a, just a picture right there of um, a regular barnacle, um, smilium, which is actually um, hermaphroditic, but there are also these dwarf males and that's a dwarf male shown on hermaphroditic individual. He does nothing but put his penis into that hermaphrodite and try and fertilize the eggs with them. And without going into the details, Darwin proposed that an ancestral hermaphroditic barnacle, like this one here, evolve into what he called an androdioecious barnacle. That is one in which there were both hermaphroditic individuals and separate males, dwarf males, and that eventually evolved into barnacles that had separate sexes. And he set about in his studying of barnacles to document which ones were what are called protandrous hermaphrodites, male first, and then male and female together, which ones had both females or males and separate hermaphroditic individuals, and which ones had separate sexes. And in so doing, he began to understand what an evolutionary transformation looked like when he could observe it in nature. And he wrote as he came back from his trip, um, I hate barnacle as no man ever did before, not even a sailor in a slow sailing ship. And it really aged him. Um, these are pictures of Darwin, well, not the one on the lower left, but during and after, after nine years of working on barnacles. So here's the very end, and I'm sorry I've gone on too long. Um, first lesson from the sea came from his time at Edinburgh about embryology and phylogeny, which provided clues to ancestry and identity. His work on coral atolls 
gave him really profoundly important insights into retrodiction and how to test in the future an evolutionary hypothesis. And also his work on barnacles helped him understand what an evolutionary transformation or was he, what he set about to do, that is, he set about to be plotting a bloodline. And finally, the third lesson from the sea is never ever trust a marine biologist. He really got screwed by Professor Robert Grant, but that in turn, I think, was critical in his, in his starting his own career as an evolutionary biologist and not becoming a physician. So I hope I've given you a little bit of an idea of why I think, like Daniel Dennett, that the idea of evolution by natural selection was the single best idea um, that anybody has ever had. That's Darwin's synopsis of it. And I want to conclude by wishing tomorrow would be Darwin's 213th birthday. Darwin lived his life to the best, to the very end. Darwin's daughter, Henrietta, imagined or wrote in her recollections of her father. Um, we gave him some of the whiskey when he was dying and he was able to swallow. And after three teaspoonfuls, he recovered consciousness. Happy birthday. Go have yourselves a beer tomorrow in celebration of Darwin's birthday and also the other great and brilliant um, man born on the same day, the same year, Abraham Lincoln. Thank you all very, very much for your time. Enjoy the rest of your Friday afternoon. I apologize for having gone on for two. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rick. Um, we're all glad, I'm sure, that there's no test because you gave us such great information and such a volume of it, more, far more than I ever knew about Darwin. Regretfully, we have run out of time. We won't have time for any questions. We didn't have a lot that came in because you were busy giving us so much great information. So thank you so much. Yeah, and I just want to say I did. I am looking at the Q and A, and Kate, I wish I had had time to mention Darwin, the book um, Darwin, Darwin, His Daughter and Human Evolution by Randall Keynes. It is a great book, and it's a deeply moving book. Um, I mean, really a good book. And then Cindy Sikonik, he went to college to be a religious leader. Yeah, his family wasn't very religious at all. It was just sort of a profession um, that a gentleman who had no other career but a fair amount of money would go into. It was a default. It wasn't by conviction. Thank you. Um, my father was um, Army Air Corps, um, second lieutenant, um, second lieutenant, um, one of the few Army Air Corps um, officers on Anna Weetok. Um, and his name was Alan Grossberg. So, um, yeah, and he was a fighter pilot and an escort pilot out there. Um, and yeah, learn to learn to play cards too. Great. Thank you, Doctor. We're going to turn this back over to Tom and he's going to wrap it up for us. Okay, Rick, thanks so much. Uh, we all appreciate uh, the fascinating facts about Darwin and his upbringing, and uh, especially about the barnacles. Uh, well, we have all learned something today that I think most of us didn't know before. Uh, as a result of your presentation, we thank you and uh, are awarding you an honorary membership to the Renaissance Society for a year. Hope you take advantage of the classes and the forums in the future. And we're also making a, a monetary donation to the Seth Nelson Student Emergency Grant Fund for needy students who can't, uh, can't survive the, uh, the high prices of food or, or, or lodging. So thanks thank very you. much for that. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, oh, and Marty, just quickly answer your question. He didn't have to make a living. He married a Wedgwood. So they had plenty of money on that side of the family. And today's recording, uh, today's presentation was recorded and is archived. So you can view it in two separate ways. You can go to the Renaissance Society forum channel on YouTube or from the actual uh, Renaissance website, you can access it there. And associated students, uh, Food Pantry is uh, providing food to needy students and consider donating to them at the beginning of each month. You can access them by this uh, website here or just go on to the um, the um, Renaissance website itself and you can access a place where you can donate. And next week's forum is going to be an interesting one as well. Uh, it's the role and importance of football and athletics in college life at CSUS. And that's going to be with our own president from CSUS, Dr. Robert Nelson, and the uh, head football coach, Troy Taylor, who has uh, a good, great reputation of his own. So all in all, thank you all for joining us today and uh, we'll see you in a week. Thanks very much.